Hi everyone, and thanks again for joining our webinar. We're still waiting for a few more attendees, uh, so the webinar will begin in about three minutes. Thank you. Hello again, and welcome to the webinar, Utilizing Renewable Energy in the Transition to a Low-Carbon Economy. My name is Nicole Nagaiwi, Key Account Manager at the South Pole Group, and I will be guiding you through today's presentation. During the last few months, we've seen the topic of renewable energy really rising up the agenda for many companies. New reporting guidelines for the CDP and GHG protocol mean that companies can now more easily use renewable energy to reach their sustainability goals. The purpose of this webinar is to provide an overview on how you can take leadership and really be part of this movement. We will be addressing the importance of renewable energy in the transition to a low carbon economy, the types of renewable energy solutions available on the market, some of the key challenges companies face in the transition to renewable energy, particularly when it comes to sourcing renewable energy in what might be perceived as more challenging regions, such as emerging markets. And finally, how you can identify solutions that best fit your company's strategic objectives. Today's speakers are myself, John Davis, Director of the Financial Industry, and Natalia Gorina, Sales Director for Carbon and Renewables. John is an accomplished sustainability professional with years of experience advising large corporates on their sustainability strategies. He recently joined the South Pole Group 
where he heads the financial industry key account management team. Natalia is one of the key renewable energy experts at the South Pole Group. She also has years of experience working with clients in various industries to help meet their renewable energy needs. We'd like you to get involved during the course of this webinar by asking questions. You can do this by posting your questions in the question panel on the right side of your screen. A selection of these questions will then be answered at the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We will also be conducting anonymous polls at the end of this webinar. We will ask you to answer a few questions on the topic of renewable energy. Participation in these polls is of course voluntary, but we would encourage you to join us. So the agenda for today is the following. John will start by providing an overview of the South Pole Group and how our clients are using renewable energy in the transition to a low carbon economy. Natalia will then dive deeper into the various types of renewable energy solutions available. And finally, we'll, we'll end the presentation with a brief Q&A session and an overview of the results of the polls. And now I'll hand over to John, who will give us a short overview of who we are and how we can help companies create value through sustainability. Thanks very much, Nicole. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, webinar. I'm John Davis, and as Nicole mentioned, new to the South Pole Group, I'm based in London. Our team, which interacts with our financial clients here at the South Pole Group, includes Nicole and Guillaume Gatton in Zurich, Dr. Max Horster in Frankfurt, Jan Ayer in Stockholm, and in California, Stephen Schofield. Within the financial sector, we are seeing a growing momentum of companies looking to not only reduce their carbon footprint, but undertake additional pledges of varying size to source renewable energy for a vast majority, if not all, of their power supply. We'll focus on the opportunities that can be cultivated through careful planning and strategic sourcing of the right renewable instruments. It's important to note that this transition we're seeing to renewable energy will not happen overnight, but the sooner companies start preparing for this change and utilizing the positive impacts that it can have on their business, the better they can design their energy sourcing strategies for the years ahead. A little introduction on the South Pole Group for those that have not worked with us before. We're a global sustainability firm that has been recognized as a world leader in the space for 10 years. We have a tremendous on-the-ground presence that stretches all the way from Australia to Asia, Africa to America, and across Europe. Regardless of where you've tuned in from today, we're most likely not too far from your office. As a result of our wide network, the South Pole Group's developed an incredible capacity to understand local challenges when implementing global solutions aimed at reducing your carbon emissions, no matter where they're taking place. We are extremely well placed within the global energy market to source and supply renewable energy solutions from almost all countries connected to an electricity grid. As an award-winning sustainability company, we're a driving change in the way companies acknowledge and assess their carbon exposure. Having established ourselves as a leader in the development of emissions reductions projects, seen here with reference to the 50 million tons of CO2 saved, we have used our success to enter in other areas of sustainability, always with a focus on climate change and sustainable solutions. What you see here are just some of the benefits that our global pipeline of actions has allowed us to achieve so far. Renewable energy being a key product that we believe in to achieve a more sustainable future. We work with some of the largest and most sustainable companies in the world across a number of industries to help them achieve their targets and invent new and innovative ways to reduce their climate impact. This slide reflects some of those that fall within the financial sector that this webinar is created for. The sector is unique in that the transition to renewable energy supply is one that is not only driven through a wish to be more sustainable, but importantly through companies wishing to stay at the front of the curve in an intensely competitive industry, ensuring along the way that they do not encompass any reputational risk for their shareholders or clients. Customers have always demanded best practice from their financial partners, and this best practice is beginning to become more demanding on sustainability, climate, and renewable energy. Through these drivers, we find renewable energy a highly desirable asset for institutions that care for their investors, customers, and for the climate. Renewable energy certificates, or RECs, 
represent an important entry to the market for all corporates planning to meaningfully decrease their greenhouse gas emissions. RECs are a low-risk product with high impact. Low-risk in terms of the cost, the physical delivery, and the counterparty that you face. And we're one of the few suppliers that are able to offer REC products from across the globe, which Natalia will give more detail on soon. During the course of the next five slides, I'll illustrate the importance of the REX market towards the global momentum to combat climate change. So why is renewable energy relevant now? A good starting point is the recent agreement made in Paris from the COP21 meeting from December last year. This agreement represents a historic moment for climate change as it constitutes the single most important piece of legislation concerning the reduction of greenhouse gases on a global scale. The key information for you with regard to this slide is Firstly, national governments will trickle down these ambitious targets to corporates, but it will be your responsibility to implement strategies that will keep the temperature below the agreed target. So while it's their signature on the agreement, it will be your reputation on the line. Secondly, the agreement is specifically designed to stimulate corporations to act on two fronts, by supporting you to reduce emissions at home and to encourage you to finance emission reduction projects abroad, specifically in emerging markets. In addition, if you found the process and outcome of the Paris Agreement as confusing as I did initially, I highly recommend you check out our YouTube channel, where our CEO, Renat Hoberger, has put together a very succinct presentation on the COP21. This next slide demonstrates the underlying investment needed to reach the target of the Paris Agreement and underlines how corporate support from entities such as yours can help close this gap in renewable energy. Renewable energy supply may meet current demands, but it's clear that future capacity will have to be added to the electricity network across the globe to prepare for this renewed demand and meet global targets. As a result of the limited renewable resources in most countries, there's clearly an advantage to being an early mover within the renewable energy marketplace. The Diplomatic Agreement of Paris has provided an excellent economic playground for corporates to achieve emissions reductions in a variety of ways. The question is no longer if the world will transition to cleaner energy, but rather how long will it take? The table on this slide portrays consumption of energy in 2014, both in total, the blue column, and as renewable energy in green, and compares across industries. Whilst the financial sector's energy demands are relatively small, the relative contribution to renewable energy is sizable, but it's an industry that was capable of making decisions to be partly or wholly renewable very easily. What I find very interesting about the green or sustainable credentials of the financial industry is that there's a very strong correlation between renewable energy usage, market cap, and leadership. We've talked about leading by example for some of the largest corporations in the financial sector. Renewable energy has become more than a competitive edge, but a necessity. This page illustrates the growing number of regional and global pledges and initiatives, many of these led by companies within finance. We've summarized some of them on this, some of the most prominent on this slide. You can see the market leaders who have pledged the RE100 initiative, which is a commitment to use 100% renewable electricity by 2020. These signatories are gaining the first mover advantage and a great deal of positive publicity would be associated with some of the world's most influential companies that are already participants of this movement. Several other initiatives exist in different regions which encourage or facilitate the purchase of renewable energy. And these are an example of some and the signatories. This next slide, uh, look at a case study held by a client of ours, PwC Australia. When it comes to defining and implementing a renewable strategy, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all solution. Corporates have different priorities, budgets, timeframes, and risk appetite. Luckily, our portfolio of solutions can accommodate all of this. Uh, this PwC Australia case study outlines all the elements of the challenge and the opportunity that are embedded in a renewable energy sourcing strategy. Day-to-day -day business operations are considered the most significant impact of PwC, and even though their footprint's low compared to other industries, they've been committed to actively reducing and offsetting their carbon emissions since 2008. As a strong supporter of renewable energy, and with many of their clients in this industry, they were keen to begin incorporating renewable energy into their offset procurement strategy. PwC sought to procure high quality domestic or international RECs that would allow them to continue to use 100% renewable energy offsets for their electricity emissions. The challenge was to achieve carbon neutral certification by finding a carbon offset or renewable energy certificate solution 
of not only good value for money, but also reputable, transparent, high quality, and low risk. How did PwC proceed? Well, PwC went to market with very specific evaluation criteria, but also to ensure that we're dealing with companies with strong quality assurance principles. PwC chose to work with the Southwell Group because we were able to demonstrate strong technical capabilities, track record of providing high quality carbon offsets and RECs, and most importantly, a robust approach to risk management, quality assurance, and reporting systems. What's the solution for PwC? They went ahead to choose a gold power renewable energy from a wind power project in Thailand. And since this case study, PwC then went on to purchase more gold power renewable energy from a wind power project in Turkey. Uh, gold power is a specific renewable energy label that was developed by Client Friendly, part of the South Pole Group, with the support of WWF, one of the world's leading conservation organizations, in response to a demand for a truly global and truly effective renewable energy label. It's a product that guarantees people WC safe access to renewable energy for its operations while also promoting the share of renewables in the global energy mix. Gold Power has substantial positive economic, social, and environmental impacts on the communities where the products are located. I now I'll pass you over to Natalia, who will go into more detail in renewable energy solutions. Thank you very much, John. Uh, indeed, I'm going to talk more into, uh, about the renewable energy solutions which are available for companies who want to meet a uh, renewable energy target. So, um, basically we group into four uh, different solutions that companies uh, can purchase in order to uh, meet their renewable energy target. And um, the first is different from the other three in the sense that the first is REC procurement is the only one where you are purchasing the environmental attribute of renewable energy separately or in an unbundled way um, from the underlying electricity. In other words, um, you as a consumer of uh, electricity can actually choose two different vendors, uh, one that will supply the electricity you the physical electricity through the grid and one uh, which will supply the the renewable energy certificate the other three uh, solutions renewable energy solutions um, actually entail a bundled product where the renewable electricity the physical electricity comes together with the green credentials of this electricity in the form of renewable energy certificate so I will go into detail of each of them um, one of the most commonly used products, renewable energy products, is so-called the green power tariff or the green power product, which is typically offered by uh, local utilities. So you can choose as a consumer, sometimes even residential consumers, um, but mostly, um, mostly companies, commercial consumers, they can choose from, uh, from their utility a green product, which can be um, a general green electricity uh, or even some, with some specific um, specifications on the technology behind it, so percentage of solar versus hydro or biomass, etc. So here you will be purchasing, as I said, electricity together with the renewable energy certificate. But you as a consumer will most likely not see the renewable energy certificates because it will be the utility who will purchase this on the market and retire the certificates on your behalf. Now, another um, quite used form of renewable energy solution is a power purchase agreement, agreement with a renewable energy provider. It's usually a bilateral contract between a consumer, and the consumer here has to be a large consumer, so it has to have uh, quite some electricity consumption to be interested in signing a contract directly with the producer of electricity, so a power generator. And um, the power purchase agreement is generally a long-term agreement, so we are talking about 10, 15 years minimum. And the agreement is a quite complicated contract which uh, entails um, all the specifications on how the electricity will be delivered, um, who takes the risks, uh, what happens um, if there are outages and so on. And typically it entails as well the passage of the ownership of the renewable energy certificate, if there is one, or at least the renewable energy attribute, environmental attribute, which will pass on to the consumer. 
Um, finally, there is a possibility to directly invest into renewable energy installations. Typically, these are uh, smaller scale, um, for example, uh, PV installations, rooftop installations, or small scale wind power plants that a company decides to invest in, so by providing equity or loans. And then, uh, in order to claim then this green electricity, the company has to consume this electricity as well, rather than inputting in it to the grid. <clears throat> now, what are the challenges in sourcing renewable energy according to these different uh, solutions or ways to source renewable energy? Well, the first challenge is actually the location, so the availability of, this, uh, of these solutions in every in each country in the world. In fact, what happens is that uh, in many countries where there are no liberalized markets, for example, or there is a state monopoly controlling the electricity sector, um, there is no possibility to sign a power purchase agreement, or, for example, utilities are simply not offering green power tariffs. And so um, companies who want to still purchase renewable electricity, especially in developing countries, they have to look for other solutions. And usually the renewable energy certificates are the, um, the most available um, solution in, in developing countries especially, and as well as in industrialized countries. Another point to take into account when, when you're thinking on which, um, which way to, to go when sourcing renewable energy is um, your general strategy. So for example, have you signed up to, to the RE100 initiative or another, um, or have you had another target to, to move to 100% uh, renewable energy by a certain date? And is this target a long-term target? So for example, RE100 is typically 2020, the year by which you have to turn to 100% renewable energy. Or is it a short-term target, so you want to reach it much earlier? Then this will typically guide then the, the type of solution you will, you will want to, to choose. Um, so if you want a more short-term if you have a more short-term target, then usually re renewable energy certificates are the best way to, 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 to meet this target. But if you have more time, then you can also engage in, in, in more longer-term solutions, such as the power purchase agreement or, or, a, or a direct investment. Another important thing is also what is your um, appetite for risk? Of course, what's your budget? How much money you would like to, t to spend on this? And, uh, on, and your internal resources, because if you have to, um, for example, uh, negotiate a long-term power purchase agreement, you will need some legal, commercial, technical resources internally to be able to, uh, to, to, to dedicate to quite lengthy negotiations. So all of these uh, issues have to be taken into account when choosing which way to go. Now, uh, a little bit more information on renewable energy certificates. Um, so as mentioned before, these are certificates which are, which are issued in, uh, in digital form. They represent one megawatt hour of, of renewable electricity produced by by a specific power plant, renewable energy power plant. And uh, these are typically held in um, in electronic tracking systems or registries. So the renewable energy certificate will be issued in a registry where you can see it and then can be transferred to another, uh, another account holder and most importantly can be retired. In other ways it can be uh, renewable energy certificates can be cancelled forever for the purpose of demonstrating that that specific rack has been used to match uh, um, uh, non-renewable electricity consumption of a company. And also, for example, if you want to disclose um, that a certain type of electricity has been consumed, then you need to show that that rack has been retired on your behalf. <clears throat> now, what about the, um, the use of renewable energy certificates specifically by the financial and professional services sector? So this is a, these are some numbers, statistical numbers from the uh, RE100 annual report, which was issued beginning of this year. Uh, but it refers to data of uh, consumption data of 2014, and this only, these are only data of companies that have reported, have signed to the RE100, and therefore have reported their consumption. So as you can see, actually, renewable energy certificates have been um, the, um, the type. <clears throat> the type of renewable energy mostly used by uh, the financial sector. 60% of, um, of financial and professional services companies reporting to RE100 have, have purchased RECs. 
And then the second mostly used uh, options are actually green tariffs and direct investment, with power purchase agreements being the, the least used. It's important, important to note actually that uh, a company can choose also several options. So the same company may be, uh, for example, buying Rex for the majority of its consumption and then investing as well into a PV installation on its rooftop, for example. And to put these numbers into perspective, um, uh, these relative numbers, so uh, the absolute consumption of three 100 um, reporters in 2014 belonging to the financial and professional services sector was 3.5 million megawatt hours. And um, out of this total electricity consumption, 1 million megawatt hours were purchased as renewable energy. So then you can say that 60% of this 1 million, about 600,000 megawatt hours, were purchased as RECs. All right, so what, um, what is actually available out there in terms of renewable energy certificates? Well, actually, this, um, this slide we have to update quite often because the situation in the picture changes very quickly. In fact, there are more and more countries which, are, which have uh, renewable energy certificate systems available. So, for example, as, as I'm speaking here, uh, by, um, there is also Honduras as a, as a country which has the renewable uh, international RECs, IRECs available from last week. So it's really a uh, um, quickly changing picture. So let me go a little bit more in detail of the different uh, systems which are out there. Um, the two systems which are mo mostly, um, mostly established are the North American RAC system and the European Guarantees of Origin system. So um, the North American system has been, um, includes um, almost all uh, states in the United States, so uh, as well as Canada. And there are uh, nine uh, registries, which uh, are either state level or encompass, encompass several states. And these registries um, are used to issue and track and transfer and retire uh, US RECs. And uh, some of them are interconnected, so you can actually import and export RECs among them. And some, um, some of the states in the, in the US actually uh, have created these REC systems as part of um, renewable portfolio standards, so basically compliance systems. And then at the same time, these RECs are used for uh, voluntary purchases, so basically companies who want to voluntarily um, match their electricity consumption with renewable energy certificates. Um, those who do so voluntarily typically use a Green E certification. Um, the Green is an NGO um, based in the U.S. which checks that, for example, the same rack has not been used also for, to meet a, com uh, a compliance target, but has been only used for voluntary reasons. In, the Europe, in Europe, the Guarantees of Origin system has also been operating for quite some years already. It has been established at a, um, under a European directive, um, which um, was created really for... Um, um, for, for utilities mainly to um, demonstrate, uh, to disclose from which renewable energy sources their electricity was coming from, the electricity that they were selling to their consumers. And uh, in Europe, the utilities have to um, supply and retire guarantees of origin in order, to, um, in order to guarantee to their consumers the origin of, of the electricity they sell. Um, there is also... Um, Different, uh, different registries. The registries are at, uh, are at national level and they're operated by national, um, national government bodies or state, state bodies, but all these registers are interconnected in, uh, by a hub and so uh, guarantees of origin can be, can be transferred very easily between different countries. There are still some European countries who do not have a registry operational. And if a company has electricity consumption in that country, you can still purchase guarantees of origin to match that electricity consumption. Simply, the guarantees of origin will, be, will need to be retired as called as ex-domain cancellation. Uh, in other words, will need to be retired in an existing registry. And you have to mention uh, on behalf of which company, on behalf of which country of operation, those guarantees of origin have been retired. So in other words, you, really the whole of Europe is covered by this system. Then there are some national systems which are uh, indicated here in light blue. Um, 
which have been born either as compliance systems or as purely voluntary systems. And so they are in Brazil, in South Africa, in India, in Japan, in Australia. They are quite different one from each other, but um, I could say that um, in general, if you have electricity consumption in one of these countries, you can purchase racks from these systems in order to, um, to match that electricity consumption and claim renewable energy um, in those locations. Finally, there are also two international systems. One, as I already just mentioned, was the International RAC standard, which was really born um, to um, quite recently, so um, started in around 2014, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, um, and was really uh, the system was created uh, to um, to fill the gap for those countries who do not have national RAC systems in place yet, and um, the system was really to was created to kind of imitate the way the European and the North American systems function. And now there are more and more countries who have IRECs available, um, uh, mainly in, in Asia, but also in, in Mexico, in Chile, in Honduras, as I said. So there are more in Uganda. There are more and more coming up. Um, and finally, there is um, also gold power as a renewable energy certificate available internationally. Uh, it's a product that has been developed by Climate Friendly as um, um, a part of South Park Group, as John mentioned. And um, the difference between gold power and IREX um, is mainly from the fact that the gold power can only be produced by uh, power plants in developing countries which have been uh, certified by the Gold Standard Foundation and therefore are, have also co-benefits like economic, social, and environmental benefits for the local communities who live around the power plants as well as um, they are certified as, uh, as additional. In other words, it would not have happened um, without the sale, the revenue coming from the sale of the environmental attributes from these power plants. Uh, just one more thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, South Pole Group, uh, being a, a project developer, um, is actually uh, often uh, encountering uh, demand from clients who say, well, look, I have, a, um, I have operations in a country which is gray on this map, so how do you go about it? And um, so we would help these clients to um, to register uh, new projects, or develop new projects, renewable energy projects in those countries, and get them registered under, for example, the IREC standard or the gold power. So um, that is such opportunity as well. So what are the criteria that a company should take into account when selecting a renewable energy certificates? So definitely the geographic location is very important, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's important because there are some guidelines uh, by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol on, uh, what, uh, on what racks can be used uh, to match el electricity consumption in what country. And typically, let's say the general rule is uh, uh, the, um, the, a country by country match is, is, uh, is the best. Um, but um, when there is a regional scheme available, then you can actually purchase RECs from that from that scheme. So this thing, for example, is um, is valid for the U.S. Or, or or Europe, where you can have electricity consumption anywhere in Europe, and you can buy guarantees of origin generated anywhere in Europe to match that electricity consumption. Then um, the age of the plant is also very important. In fact, um, racks are being produced by uh, all power plants which are operational at the moment. And they could be operating already for many, many years. Have been, for example, hydro plants, um, especially if they have been refurbished, uh, they could operate for, uh, for 50, 100 years even. So um, if you actually would like to uh, contribute to, to new power plants or um, to, the, yeah, to the construction of, uh, of new, uh, new installations, then it's, it's wise to, to ask your provider uh, what, uh, what is the commissioning date of the plant that is generating these tracks. And there are also some eco-labels um, uh, on the market in, in, in Europe and internationally which are actually looking into this, um, this criterion and they're only allowing um, uh, the, the plant to receive this eco-label if uh, it is a recent plant and there are different um, different definitions of what is recent. Is it the most, uh, the, 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 built in the past 10 years or even less? 
Then additionality is a concept um, that in the renewable energy sector um, basically means, again, whether or not your purchase of, of from RECs is contributing to new, uh, new investment, new installations. So this is, again, linked to the, to the eco-labels. Um, the vintage year is important as well because uh, the greenhouse gas protocol requires the, the vintage year is the generation year um, of the electricity uh, to which the rack refers to. Um, so the greenhouse gas protocol requires the vintage year of the rack to be as close as possible to the year of consumption of electricity. And um, this, is, this varies slightly from one system to another. For example, in the US with Green E certification, um, um, the current consumption, let's say in year 2016, can be matched with Green E RECs generated in 2016, the second half of 2015, and the first three months of the year after 2017. So this as close as possible is interpreted in this way. Um, in Europe, for example, guarantees of origin typically expire after one year. In other words, they, they cease to exist. Their lifetime is only one year or 13 months. And so um, this vintage year becomes, uh, becomes shorter uh, compared to the U.S. Um, then the timing of rec retirement is basically the delivery date um, is also important because, of course, it has to occur before the expiry date of the, of the rec. And the uh, renewable energy technology and co-benefits, these are actually criteria which are typically more, uh, more preferences um, uh, for, uh, for certain companies. So there, are no, there is no general rule. It depends on, on uh, there are some companies who, who prefer, for example, solar power plants, others who don't like big dam uh, hydro projects, others who, who, who very, like, very much prefer biomass and so on. And the co-benefits, which, which I mentioned, there are some power plants, especially in developing countries, who um, also contribute to, to the well-being of the local communities um, who live around the power plant. And so um, there are some, um, some power plants on which there is a, a quite nice story to tell, to you, to also to your consumers to, for internal and external communication. So this is an example of a power plant which South Pole Group has registered under the International REC standard. It's a large solar installation in Mexico, um, which came online quite recently in September 2013 um, and uh, generates about 45,000 megawatt hours of clean electricity per year, which uh, meets the demand of over 160,000 people. And so it's quite an interesting uh, power plant. It's one of the first large-scale PV installations in, in Mexico. So just, just an example of the type of um, um, rack projects that, um, that we can offer. And finally, so once you have purchased renewable energy certificates, as well as other types of solutions, so also if you have invested in, a, in an installation or are purchasing green tariff, green tariff product, uh, as well as a power purchase agreement, you would, would typically want to report this purchase um, to di under different sustainability frameworks. So um, the RE100 initiative, which I already mentioned, is definitely one of them. Um, you can <clears throat> you can reach your RE100 target by using renewable energy certificates as well as the other types of uh, renewable energy solutions, which I mentioned earlier. There are the technical criteria, which are published in the RE100 website, uh, which specify um, how um, specify what type of uh, racks and how how these have to be accounted for. Um, so there are quite and actually you if you are a RE100 signatory, you can actually influence and lobby the RE100 body um, to to change these uh, these technical uh, criteria and guidelines. Um, so that's something which is possible for you as a, as a signatory. Then there is the greenhouse gas protocol, which I um, uh, mentioned several times. The, um, the greenhouse gas protocol scope two guidance was um, was released in January 2015, um, and goes very much into detail on how you you should report greenhouse gas emissions. Um, coming from consumption of electricity and heat, that, that's the scope too. And um, in the, the, this guidance 
introduces for the first time a so-called market-based method uh, under which you can report all sorts of contractual instruments, including renewable energy certificates, uh, and you can report them at zero emission rate as long as these contractual instruments meet um, uh, certain quality criteria which are listed in the greenhouse gas protocol. So for example, that vintage criteria on the location, a geographic criterion, is part of this list. And so um, the cool thing is definitely the fact that you can report this, um, the emissions coming from, um, so basically if you have electricity consumption and and you would have quite high uh, emissions coming from this electricity consumption uh, based on fossil fuels. If you match this electricity consumption with RECs, which are eligible under this uh, uh, quality criteria, then you can report this, um, um, this electricity consumption at zero rate, so emissions zero. And this, of course, will help you to meet your um, emissions targets if you have some as well as, and this leads to the next point, if you are also reporting to CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project, then um, purchasing uh, uh, renewable energy contractual instruments such as RECs will also allow you to earn points, uh, so scores, and hence you will have more uh, likelihood to end up on the so-called A-list, the CDP Carbon Performance Leadership Index. Of course, you have to do a lot of other things as well, um, such as disclosure, verification of your emissions data, and so on. There is very uh, a lot of things. Um, uh, so it's not that if you purchase Rex, you will be for sure on the A-list. Absolutely not. There is a lot of other um, other issues you have to take into account. But definitely, the purchase of Rex and other contractual instruments can help you to reach this goal. And um, just a final note, uh, also here, um, we are quite accustomed in um, in helping our clients in, in navigating all these different technical criteria and documentation on of the of the greenhouse gas protocol CDP R100 as well as other uh, sustainability frameworks. So we can help you to to choose the right contractual instruments that meet these different criteria. So that's um, that's it from my side. Thanks very much, Natalia. We've almost finished uh, today's webinar, so before I summarize, I'll just show you this slide which portrays an example of the various labels that we can apply within the financial industry, which is just a small part of our marketing offer. Communication is an essential part of our solutions to clients. We want to make sure that you get the recognition for your climate action, both within your company, to associate with stakeholders, as well as to external investors, clients, and competitors. To summarize this presentation on renewable energy within the financial sector, let's recap on some of the most important statements from this webinar. The world's first global climate agreement is a strong signal that low carbon investments will pay off. Without doubt, and as far as the global diplomatic community is concerned, low carbon future is not only a possibility, it's now inevitable. For example, think of what your own industry leaders are doing already in this area with significant and diversified investment from the field for renewable energy. Renewable energy is on the rise, but corporate support for renewable energy is critical for ensuring future supply. At the recent UN Climate Conference, IKEA's Chief Sustainability Officer, Steve Howard, advised businesses that want to survive the transition to a low carbon economy should strive for 100% transformation, whatever goals they set. He goes on to say, give the whole company no choice and change goes better. When you set a 100% target, it's easy. Challenge is to find the right solutions that save money and fit seamlessly into the core business strategy. Through the purchase of international renewable energy, the financial industry is quickly moving towards a clean energy future. Rex are cost-effective, low-risk instruments that enable companies to lower their carbon footprint and simultaneously contribute to the growth of renewable energy globally. Communication is key as stakeholders are increasingly putting a premium on companies that demonstrate corporate responsibility. We are, of course, concerned not just with the short-term objectives and gains. What we want to help you put in place is a long-term strategy that will consider your business and your energy consumption, not just as a point in time, but as a trajectory that will be influenced by other external factors. I'll pass you back to Nicole. Thank you, John, and also thank you, Natalia, for your insights. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to the question panel on the right side of your Natalia and John will be answering these shortly. But first, we'd like to proceed with the polls. 
please answer the questions that will be appearing as pop-up windows on your screen. I will go ahead and start with the first question, which is, what are the key constraints or issues affecting your renewable energy sourcing strategy? And here there are multiple answers possible. First would be lack of data, an awareness of available products and services, price or budgetary reasons, other CSR priorities, or none of the above. And I'll give you a moment to answer this question. Many thanks. So now we can move on to the second poll. Which kind of renewable energy solutions are you currently pursuing? And here, once again, there are multiple answers possible. The first is REX, Green Power Procurement, Power Purchase Agreement, Direct Project Investment, or none of the above. Once again, I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer this question. Okay, and now for our final poll, which regions are the most interesting for you in terms of sourcing RECs? North America or South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, or Europe? I'll once again give you a second to answer this question. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, now we'll take a second to look at the results of the polls, um, which I think are quite interesting. So here you can see for the que first question, what are the key constraints or issues affecting your renewable energy sourcing strategy? People said none of the above. I think that's the first time we've had this in any of our webinars. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone wants to put in the question panel, I, it would be interesting for us to see what, what would be the key constraints or issues affecting your renewable energy sources, if you do have any key constraints or issues. Um, John or Natalia, do you have any comments on that? Hi, Nicole, thanks. I think this one's probably more interesting coming than the previous, um, which is obviously an even distribution across the line in terms of the renewable energy solutions, uh, which is very similar to the webinar we ran yesterday. Um, we're actually, interestingly, no one looking here at power purchase agreements, looking at overtake agreements from um, energy suppliers, but uh, even balance across green power to RECs and um, actually investing directly into projects. Um, Power purchase agreements obviously are a little bit more structured and, and can be a very long-term contract, hence uh, why for some companies not, not a quite a um, preferable solution as opposed to the simpler solutions which people have opted to select there. Okay, thanks a lot. And maybe we'll just look at the results of the third poll. Okay, so here once again, there's a very even distribution, so it seems people are equally interested in all of the key regions that we source from. John or Natalia, do you have any comments there? Um, I, again, uh, not too much to comment on across the board, people interested, which is what we're finding within the financial industry as well. Uh, most of the financial players that we see within the market have presence across the globe, and um, which is why we find that the solutions we have in Rex appeal to, to a lot of our clients. Um, and we can provide, obviously, renewable energy solutions from, from every continent, which is listed here. Thanks a lot, John. I'll now close the poll. Once again, thank you, everyone, for your participation. The results of the polls will be summarized in an infographic on our blog, readyfor2020.com. Now we'd also like to give you a chance to ask your questions. If you haven't already done so, please submit any questions you might have through the question panel on the right side of your screen. Um, 
and our first question is, what is the difference between RECs and offsets? Natalia, maybe you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so what is the difference between carbon offsets and RECs? Um, in, I would actually start with the reporting, which is quite, uh, I think, the most interesting point for, for multinational corporations in the financial sector. Um, from the reporting point of view, under the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, um, you can report both carbon offsets and RECs. Uh, however, uh, only RECs will allow you to, re to, to show um, zero emissions from uh, scope 2. In other words, if you match your electricity consumption with RECs, you can show that that electricity consumption, if it, let's say you match 100% of your electricity consumption with RECs, then your, electricity, then your emissions from electricity consumption would be zero. While if you match your uh, other emissions from scope 1, in other words, direct emissions, and scope 3, so these are typically supply chain emissions or uh, emissions from products, as well as transport and so on, and um, employees commuting and so on, um, so indirect emissions. So if you match this with, uh, with offsets, you can still report it and you should do so in your uh, greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gas report as well as CDP. Uh, however, you cannot um, report emissions zero. You simply compensate your emissions with carbon offsets. So that's the main difference in terms of reporting. Um, have, in terms of uh, what sort of claim you can make, um, if you purchase carbon offsets you, um, that match your entire uh, emissions, uh, so your emissions footprint, you can uh, claim so-called carbon neutrality. However, usually this is being done as a third step in a longer um, carbon management program, where first you measure your carbon footprint, then secondly you, um, you reduce your carbon footprint internally as much as you can, um, and then you compensate with, by purchasing carbon assets. Um, and uh, the other difference between renewable energy certificates and carbon offsets is that um, renewable energy certificates, of course, are certificates coming from uh, renewable energy only, so solar, wind, hydro, um, biomass, etc. Um, renewable energy, which is typically um, inputted into the electricity grid, while carbon offsets are emissions reductions compared to a uh, baseline, and these are uh, can come from a lot of different technologies, such as uh, energy efficiency in uh, in the domestic sector and. Uh, um, such as forestry, so avoided deforestation, afforestation projects, as well as um, so domestic appliance, energy efficient domestic appliances like water filters and cook stoves and so on. So there are a lot of different types of, of technologies which are eligible uh, under carbon offset schemes compared to RECs. Um, Thank you, Nital. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Natalia. And I think we have another question from the audience, which is, what is the opinion of the South Pole Group of decentral renewable energy production at private homes? So, for example, from solar panels versus, versus large-scale production at power plants. I don't know, Natalia, if you want to take this, or if, John, you would prefer to jump in? I can do um, yeah, um, Sorry. You got uh, sorry, uh, maybe we have different things to say. Uh, so um, I can, uh, yeah, I can, I can try to answer this question. So, what's our opinion um, of the decentralized renewable energy production at private homes versus large-scale solution of power plants? Well, in terms of um, the environmental impact, actually, um, of course, large-scale um, power plants produce more electricity, obviously, renewable electricity in terms of uh, volume of megawatt hours compared to, um, compared to decentralized uh, um, private uh, home systems. But I think um, the, so the environmental impact of these large-scale solutions, is, I would say, is higher. However, I think we shouldn't really put these two solutions uh, one against the other, uh, as both are necessarily to um, to meet the, the the very tough <laughs> climate targets that the world has uh, has taken on board, uh, and, and especially in the COP on the last COP21, 
So, um, so I would say all of these solutions are actually needed, um, both the, the centralized uh, solutions as well as um, large-scale power plants. Thank you, Natalia. And now it looks like if there are no more questions, we've reached the end of our Q&A session. We'd like to thank those of you who participated in the polls and those of you who have submitted your questions. I'd also like to highlight the fact that we have attached a fact sheet about renewable energy certificates, as well as today's presentation and the PwC case study in the section called Handouts in the panel on the right side of your screen. So please take the time to download these documents if you haven't already done so. In addition, we'd like to receive your feedback on how you think today's webinar went. So you will receive a link where you can answer a few questions that we have provided. This is quite important for us to be able to improve future webinars. So please take some time to fill out the questions in the survey if you can. And of course, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to either myself, John, or Natalia. We would, of course, love to hear more about your commitments and how we can support you in reaching these. We would also like to thank you once again for your attendance and hope that our webinar has helped to provide some clarity on how sourcing renewable energy can be a business opportunity for your company. We hope to see you at future events. Thanks again. <laughs>